All right, everybody, please have a seat. We're going to soon start for the keynote. And please put your ba masks back on. That would be very much appreciated. Are you getting excited? Are you geeking out? Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's, it's been an amazing two days of talks. And what, I mean, it's, it's the best possible way to close the summit with two iconic game developers that I'm sure I don't even need to introduce. Uh, so I'm just going <laughs> to leave the stage. Uh, to uh, We're going to have a fireside with uh, Roberto and Ken Williams in a, in a moment. But first, uh, please give a warm welcome to Roberta Williams and Ken Williams, who's going to present some slides. Hi. Thank you. Ah, we're doing it? There we go. Um, well, like she said, I'm Ken Williams. That's Roberta Williams. I'm going to talk for like 18 minutes or something and kind of ramble on, and then uh, we're going to do a fireside chat and then give everybody a chance for questions if we still have time. But the quick story for anybody that doesn't... Um, aren't familiar with me and Roberta and what we did, we had a company called Sierra Online. And uh, that sounds like you know us, but so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we did, oh, what's the uh, text? Oh, we're subtitling, okay. We did um, a lot of games, uh, something like uh, 250 titles, and a book just came out, and they sent me a copy, and I wish I could have brought it here, but it's too heavy. It's 1,800 pages. As you can see, it's small print, and it lists the titles we did. And uh, we had 1,000 people, almost all were developers. We had a, um, yeah, we were developer heavy. We were a big development machine, and it's possible that, um, you know, I've done more development than about anybody because of uh, releasing 3,000 plus SKUs over time. So, but uh, I'll, I'll tell the history of Sierra in 18 or 17 minutes now and start back in 1979 when I had a uh, TRS-80 and then I upgraded to an Apple II because it actually had a floppy drive. I'd been programming for a long time at that point, doing work for kind of everybody in the Los Angeles area. And um, that was my day job, kind of going around programming big mainframe computers for people and by night, I always was trying to start a business because we wanted to move to the mountains and raise our kids in the mountains. And um, so I was trying to think of something entrepreneurial to do with an Apple computer. And about that time, Microsoft released BASIC, and I had done compiler development. So I said, this is cool. I'll do Fortran. And uh, while I was working on Fortran on the Apple II, I brought home a uh, teletype for my day job that was hooked to a computer at MIT. And I found a game that was called Adventure. And it was a text-based game interfaced with two-word commands. And people seemed to like it. And um, although at that time, I knew nothing. And it was kind of the first game I had ever seen. And uh, I started playing it. And I said, you know, this is kind of fun. And I turned it over to Roberta. And then she started playing it and took away my teletype. And I got no work work done. And uh, I've got a little video that talks about what happened then. If any so. computer was going to be a serious gaming machine for high adventure and fantasy, then it needed something special that no one had figured out yet. I had no idea how to start to write a game. But I think I need some big pieces of paper. And I remember sitting there, pen in hand, I had never done this before. So what am I writing? What is this? What am I doing? And the first thought that came to my head was, what games have I played? I came up with the game of Clue. But it has to be a story, too. It can't just be just a board game. I sort of started developing the idea of creating this world to explore with a flowchart. things to do, things to run into, characters that come along, and some are good, some are bad. You have to open up the world so you could feel like you're there. The way you do that is to give people the decisions of where they can go. 
I was drawing it and building it little by little, and I could see it develop, and I could add more obstacles, secret passages, trapdoors, and murders. When I had written my game, and it was on this big piece of paper, and I have no place else to go, because I can't program this. It's a design document. I need a programmer. I need Ken. Now, in the meantime, while I'm doing this, Ken had the idea that he would start this company. I wanted to build a company that'd be kind of a um, Microsoft style of background and was hard at work on that. So I did a little scheme. I made reservations for him and I to go to dinner. Ken always loves to go out to eat, and he was pleasantly surprised. And I was in high, high salesman mode. She was talking loudly, and people at other tables were looking at us like we were crazy. First, he was kind of like, because she was talking about murder and who was going to die and how they were going to die. And it was just kind of a weird conversation. Finally, he said, everybody else has already done text interactive stories or adventure games. You know what we need to do? And I said, what? We need to go beyond that. We need to add graphics to it. And I was like, Oh my God, oh my God. He's gonna do it, he's gonna do it. Well, that was the start of Sierra. That um, out of that dinner, um, she gave me this incredibly impossible game to do because floppy disks in those days were only 80K and I only had 48K of RAM to play with. And um, I'd never heard the word vector graphics. I don't know if anybody had, but when I started thinking about how to get all those pictures in, I said, well, maybe I just got to store the endpoints of lines. And I put them in, and that became Mystery House, kind of like the original adventure text game she played. And um, you know, there was kind of this moment when I went into a, one of the very few computer stores, I think there were 10 in the US at that time, and said, hey, look at this cool uh, Fortran compiler I'm doing, and look at this game Roberta did. And it was clear the stores wanted uh, the game. They didn't want Fortran. And um, <laughs> so I kind of dumped my project. And um, we sold Mystery House. It sold well. And then it, it, you know, a year later, I did this game called uh, Wizard and Princess. Or she actually did it, and I coded it, where the Apple II was strictly a black and white machine. But if you notice in this picture, you can see the purple and green lines. Um, what I realized was that I could fiddle with the uh, hardware and pull color out of it where there was none. I only had um, blue and green and orange and blue to play with and only occasionally, so I kind of dithered the colors together and that became a game called Miss, uh, Wizard and the Princess. And that did well and sold great, so um, IBM came to us and said, um, we got a new machine coming out called the PC Junior and it was going to be this powerful beast that was going to do all kinds of great things. And would we be willing to put Wizard and Princess on it? And um, Roberta said, well, you know, if we're going to do it and this machine has all that power, maybe there's a way to do animation because we had never done that. And uh, she defined kind of the first third person game. And that little character, King Graham, wanders around through a 3D world. And it was actually kind of a faked 2D world that we did by using layers to simulate 3D. And, um, and obviously that did pretty well. The PC Junior, it outsold the PC Junior to say the least. <laughs> and, um, and, and at that same time, is, since this is kind of a UX conference, we also did serious stuff and that we did kind of the first word processor for IBM. And I came up with this idea of using icons for the commands and because there was no WYSIWYG in those days, IBM thought it was cool and shipped it. And um, we actually did pretty well with our word processor. And Microsoft kind of liked the idea. You notice they switched their interface after that to using the icons. So um, shifting gears. Back to games. There was a, um, 
ad that one of our competitors did, Electronic Arts. And the ad was kind of, I thought, pretty, uh, pretty great. You know, we were always competing with them. And they did this ad where they showed pictures of their uh, designers. It was a two-page spread, and I couldn't find the other page. But uh, everybody looked kind of sullen. It said, can a computer make you cry? And I started thinking about that, and I realized what was missing was music and sound effects. At that point, the uh, IBM PC only had uh, one buzzer in it, and there wasn't a lot you could do. So we, um, Sierra was kind of a leader. I mean, we really, you know, my, my philosophy was always kind of leaders lead and followers follow, and that if we really wanted to do great things, then we were going to have to show the industry the way to go. So I went over to, um, I think they were called Creative Labs or AdLib, and said, maybe I could market your cards. And we made a PC card. And this one would only do uh, three voices. But we also went to Roland, who made uh, professional music. And I talked them into doing this uh, MT32, they called it. It was 32 voices of sample music. And we used MIDI in the games. And uh, that kind of worked in that um, we answered Electronic Arts ad about a year after they ran it and said, yeah, a computer can make you cry. What we did was went to CES, got a big tent, darkened everything, used the MT32 for music, played kind of our opening cartoon, and it really did leave people in tears. It was the first time they'd seen that kind of music out of a computer. So that was kind of cool. And this one I'm not going to spend a lot of time on other than to say that um, Sierra was always kind of modeled on Disney and Microsoft. You know, from Dis uh, right from day one, I said, you know, who do we want to be when we grow up? And uh, Disney was, uh, at that time, you know, every, every kid wanted to go to Disneyland. They had characters. They were launching sequels. And so, and they were also very protective of their intellectual property. When you license from Disney, it's tough. And uh, so we kind of adopted that attitude of owning all of our characters, owning our rights, um, tight control over everything. Uh, from Microsoft in those days, it was uh, Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and they had a strong personality that kind of ran that company. And I studied, you know, everything they did, and tried to. Um, well, and that Bill was a uh, programmer, and um, wanted to be like that with our team, where I was kind of hands-on. And one of their other philosophies, they had a lot of engineers in project management, you know, people that knew what they were doing. We kind of tried to follow that philosophy. And that kind of worked for us. And I, uh, you know, on this prior slide, I was going to talk a little about trips to Japan that we did and going in and seeing some of the packaging that was happening in those days. The, um, even magazines, I would look at the game magazines when I went over to Japan and see that people spent a lot of money on the uh, paper and on the printing and the uh, quality. You know, you'd walk into a store. And the store clerk wouldn't just hand you a game. They'd take the time to bundle it up, wrap it nice. And that kind of had an impact on me. So we started changing our boxes to spend a lot more money on box. And you know, since it's a UX um, conference, the user experience kind of starts with when they start touching that box. And you kind of miss that now with all the digital downloads. But there's forums still where people talk, you know, like big box forums where they talk about the old boxes Sierra did. You know, we, they, it, everything had an open front. There were 16 pages of color. Uh, we bundled maps in and all kinds of cool things. And it really flowed out of that experience of going to Japan. And when I saw uh, Steve Jobs introducing, like, the iPod and stuff, I said, you know, he, he went over to Japan. He saw what they were doing. And it's this level of quality that uh, really made a difference. Uh, here I'm going to show something different. And, um, this 1989 was before I had ever heard of the Internet, and I was pretty plugged in. And in those days, I think it was called ARPANET and was floating around colleges, but I had never heard of it. And yet, I always had, I mean, the name Sierra Online came from my days of doing big mainframes with thousands of terminals. And I always thought that there should be multiplayer games. And I came up with this vision of um, something I was calling the constant companion at the beginning, where we'd make a nice toaster-sized box, a set-top box, to give to seniors so that they could pick up a bridge game and play cross country against other seniors. And because I always believe in this crawl, walk, run strategy where you start with something simple and then build on it. So I wanted to start with that. And I went to NEC and I went to a Sprint, we're a big, big communications company in those days, and said, help me realize this vision. And they did the backbone, gave us a bunch of computers. 
we went to a bunch of people in their 80s and actually um, did it, have put together a multiplayer network of our own. And then we kind of built on it and it did a multiplayer gaming network. And I'm gonna show you what that looked like. And this was, you gotta remember, long before the internet. And we're using avatars, and I actually got the first patent on it, doing avatars and held it for a while. Um, and it was based on doing Mr. Potato Head, how you used to uh, assemble faces that way. But I'll show you what we did. Assuming the video plays. My name is Napalm, and I will play any game with bullets or grenades in it. I'm a 20-year-old redhead named Tigress. My name is Amazon Woman. The word mercy is not my vocabulary. My name is the Big Green, and I play Booger. Booger! Imagine choosing any name and personality you want to be, and then playing other people from all over the country on your personal computer in imagination. The world's premier online entertainment network totally devoted to fun and games. With a personal computer and a modem, you can engage people from across the country in real time in games like INN 3D Golf, Paintball, Stratego, Boogers, and Red Baron. There have been times when I've shot down 50 planes over Germany. And that was before lunch. And if you call now, we'll give you your first five hours free. There are also fantasy role-playing games like Serbius. My name is Erd. I have an eight-foot sword. And for once in my life, I'm not a coward. Or classic board and card games. I've been involved in bridge games so exciting that I thought my heart was going to come out of my chest. Or visit an adults-only casino and play and chat with people from all over the country. There is nothing as exciting as walking up to a perfect stranger and taking all of their money. To join the Imagination Network now, just call 1-800-625-5353. It's just $9.95 a month for five hours. And if you join now, we'll give you your first five hours and your membership kit absolutely free. I used to play chess, but boogers is more cerebral. So call 1-800-625-5353. After all, you can meet the most interesting people on the Imagination Network. My name's Thor. And then annihilate them. The best thing about this game, you never run out of bullets. Okay. You get the idea. That was a project that... Um, as you can imagine, that took off, did really well. We had, um, I mean, it's prehistoric times, and there was no internet, but we had 10,000 subscribers, and typically several thousand on at a time, playing games, and um, that, was, that was, well, and they were doing a lot of it on 300 baud modems and 1,200 baud modems. I mean, there was no concept of um, ethernet jacks in those days, so we, uh, my favorite project we ever did. But uh, uh, speaking of other cool things we did, uh, CD-ROM kind of came along at some point, and uh, Sierra figured, as usual, it was our job to uh, get there first, and so we wanted to do something, and like I said, I always do like to do, oh, okay, I gotta move here quick, this crawl, crawl walk, run strategy. So I, um, I said, let's target a preschool game. That should be easy, and uh, these are the days when it costs 30,000 bucks to burn a CD-ROM the big device we had to buy. And um, we had duplication issues because how could we possibly burn these things? But we did that. And we also did uh, a year later this game called Phantasmagoria that did really well. And uh, it was kind of the first time anybody had done live actors and a 3D rendered background. And um, then we did, well, then we sold the company. And Roberta and I retired, said we would never work again. And um, <laughs> Started boating and uh, went around the world, uh, featured in a lot of different magazines, and uh, got kind of famous as boaters. So, <laughs> and then the pandemic hit, and I was bored. And Roberta said, "Why don't you write a book?" And so I wrote a book that became kind of a bestseller. It was two years ago, and still pops up uh, to number one on Amazon, a lot of categories. So a lot of people remember Sierra. And then, for whatever reason, because COVID kept going, we were still bored, we decided to do a game. And uh, we're kind of back for at least this game, whether there's more, we'll see how well people like this game. And I could blow off playing the video, given we're running out of time, what do you think? It's short. You can see kind of what we're doing, the... Um, so take your first steps into Colossal Cave, the famed classic adventure reimagined 
by Roberto Williams, the legendary designer of King's Quest in Phantasmagoria. Explore the vast darkness of the mythical colossal cave and find the valuable treasures held within. Beware the many obstacles that stand in your way and perilous encounters that threaten to end your quest quickly and without mercy. With many locations to traverse, secrets to find, and miles of caverns to explore, you'll never know just what your own adventure inside Colossal Cave will bring. And that's it. It's uh, coming out for VR and Switch and kind of all the usual players. And with that, I'll turn it over to Celia and Roberta, give Roberta a chance to talk. Ain't that cool to have them here? Uh, again, thank you so, so much for being here because I know you're super busy uh, <laughs> right now. Uh, so it's a real pleasure and honor to, uh, to have you. So thank you again for taking the time. Um, it's our all right. pleasure. Yeah, it's no, well, no, it's our pleasure. <laughs> you can't win that. <laughs> Um, so I have a, I've had a bunch of questions, and of course we're going to take questions also from uh, from the audience. Um, but when we were preparing for uh, this uh, fireside, uh, you were worried a little bit that you couldn't say much about UX uh, because it's not your expertise. And uh, but you both worked on some of the most iconic video games of all time. So clearly, players had a great experience with your games. In retrospect, uh, why do you think your games resonated with players so much? Um, so are you talking about my games, like the adventure yep. games, or mm -hmm. just Sierra in, in general? Your games, uh, more particularly, more and Sierra really. in general, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, a lot of people said I'm a, a born storyteller, I guess, and uh, the type of games that I do, they're adventure games, and which is their own category, uh, their own genre, and um, mainly they are story, t story games. Um, and uh, you, you and exploration. Uh, an adventure game is an interactive story, basically. Um, and uh, you, uh, you usually you have there's a the story, and then there's a goal that you're trying to accomplish. It is it is um, just a um, single player <laughs> in a multiplayer world today. Um, that might seem a little boring, uh, but it is single player, and uh, and there have been. Um, questions about whether uh, an adventure game can be multiplayer, and I and there's probably some people here working <laughs> on multiplayer games that might consider their game uh, to be an adventure game as well, uh, especially those that have uh, story uh, missions and things like that, which I think a lot of them do. But I don't know that I would categorize those as an adventure game, at least in the way that I look at it. And... Um, uh, anyway, I guess the story um, it, and the exploration and, and being able to be your own boss in a, in a, in a story, in a movie, in a book um, is, is probably what people really like. Do you, when you um, design your story, do you uh, come from the perspective of the story, what you want to tell, or do you try to create certain emotions and, and experiences in your players? Well, it, it usually starts from a, a story, but also a goal. Um, because without the goal, I mean, what there's, I mean, a, a typical story, if you write a book or a, a script for a movie or something, um, you, there's no goal. Uh, it's just the story. But, uh, but in the case of, of a game, you need to have a, a goal. You know, what is it I'm doing? So it, it, it usually starts out pretty simple with just a, a simple idea of a story with a goal. And, uh, and, and then you weave in the goal with the story and, uh, and then how you accomplish it and what world you're in and you define the world. Obviously, that's going to go with whatever the story was. And, um, and if it's third person, which starting from King's Quest, it was third person. And uh, who is that character? What are the other characters that he or she is meeting and doing? And you just, uh, in, so it, it really would start out as a simple story, and then it would build up kind of layer by layer as you add in the exploration, salt, the goal, um, the, the items you use to, for your puzzles, your obstacles, and it builds up. 
Um, you have integrated very complex and various emotional topics. Well, in your emotion, games. I mean, emotion, it's funny because I never really thought of emotion at first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was more just, you know, what's the story? What's the goal? You know, what is the world? Uh, how can I make it interesting? How can I make it fun? How do I weave in different kind of story um, details? That was more important to me at the beginning, but as, as I did more and more of them, I realized that emotion is important, and that really crystallized in my game, uh, Phantasmagoria. And if anybody's ever played it, they would see a lot of emotion in it. Yeah. <laughs> and, I and I wanted to get emotion from the players, too, and uh, I think I did, because a, a lot of people told me that they were scared. <laughs> Um, and, and so to convey these uh, emotions to players uh, from a narrative game mechanics move, we can also talk about an engineering point of view if you want to uh, jump in it, uh, Ken. Uh, what's, what's your process uh, to get to these emotions, to get people scared, for example? Do you just like go with the flow again? Like the, the story and the goal is, is driving no, you? No, no, no. I mean, in the case of, I mean, you know, there are simple games and then there are the more complex games. And, and again, everything that I say has to do with an adventure game. That's what I do. You know, I don't do any other kind of game. <laughs> so uh, everything I'm going to say has to be in that context. So, um, the, you know, there are simple, the, I mean, I did like uh, Mixed Up Mother Goose, and I did Mickey's Space Adventure for, for Disney, and, uh, and The Black Cauldron for Disney from their movie, and I did uh, The Dark Crystal for Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, and I, I did those, and but I wasn't really thinking too much of emotion in those days. It was just more, um, what's the story? What's the goal? What's, you know, what's the objects to get and use and the puzzles, and, you know, and, and just try to put it all together and, and add in some fun and funny or, you know, you know uh, whatever, whatever it took to be, to be fun. I mean, it was always thinking about fun, too. Um, but it really, like I said, uh, it, with the King's Quest, I started uh, thinking more in terms of emotion um, because I, I was creating this family, uh, this royal family, <laughs> and uh, with the kids, you know, and everything, and what happened to them, and, 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 and uh, loving their, each other, and getting kidnapped, of course, by evil witches or whatever it was, and, 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 um, and then when, uh, when emotion really did come in was, I think it was King's Quest five, four. No, it was King's Quest four. That was when I put in, uh, had a protagonist, Rosella, probably the first uh, female protagonist in a computer game. And, uh, and her father was King Graham, and he, he, he just collapsed of a terrible illness, and he was going to die. And the whole kingdom was very sad. And actually, we played the uh, opening, I always called it the opening cartoon, in a big audience like this. Uh, th and, um, and people started crying. I mean, they really did. <laughs> and uh, because it was so sad. I mean, they just, they just loved, you know, Sir Graham and King Graham. And was he really going to die? And that's when it really sort of opened my eyes to the question of emotion and, and how to play with it and how to how to use it. Um, but like I said, it crystallized with Phantasmagoria. And because my goal, my, my goal was to see if, if a computer game could scare people. And, and I don't know why I wanted to scare people. I, I really don't know why, uh, but it was a challenge. And I love the idea of trying it. And I, I think part of it was I was maybe tired of being thought of as, you know, the fairy tale girl, you know, the fairy tales, and she, and she does all the, you know, the fun family, you know, kind of things, which is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think I wanted to see if I could be something more than that. And, uh, and so the idea of trying to scare people with a computer, um, there was one thing, there was a, a game right as the time when I was developing Phantasmagoria, it was like, more like an interactive movie. And I don't remember the name of it. Maybe somebody here n might know. I think it has the word dark in it, but um, they all do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was it, it was it was done with actors, and it was shot like a movie, but more it, it was more like decision trees, you know, where you'd be watching, um, you know, like a cutscene, and then 
well, do you want to, you know, want to do this or do you want to do that? And if you did that, it was another cut scene. And if you want to do that, it was another cut scene. And, and I said, well, no, that's not what I want to do. And that's not an adventure game. And that's not what I do. In fact, in my opinion, it wasn't even a game. So um, I, uh, I thought about it. And I actually, I took about six months to think about how to scare people if we're talking about emotion. And I thought about it a lot. And the first thing I thought of is, well, I need to figure out what scares me. And so I literally, I, I, I was, I read a lot of horror books and scary books and, you know, suspenseful books and, and um, Stephen King and, uh, you know, and others. And I would go around and tell, ask people to tell me scary stories. And like, you know, at the, around a campfire. Where everybody says, well, I've got the scariest story, you know, and let, let me tell you about that one. And I would have them tell me scary stories. And then I read uh, Dance Macabre that uh, Stephen King wrote, which was basically like a textbook for how to write horror or suspense. And one of the things I remembered in it, which I didn't follow his advice, but was uh, <laughs> the best scary suspenseful horror story is one that does not have depend on gore. You, you want to depend on suspense. You know, it's the suspense that's scary. Um, and, uh, and, if, and if you if you go for gore, you've, you, you know, you've, you've lost it. You know, you don't know what else to do, so you throw in the gore. But, but the really suspenseful uh, um, uh, stories are the, are the scariest. And I tried to do that, but I did throw in gore. Um, and, uh, and actually, Nothing not so that. much me, but my art director. Because uh, uh, a lot of people say, well, how could you have thought up those murders <laughs> that were pretty bad? And I, I didn't. <laughs> My art director did that. I said, I can't do that. And he said, well, I could do that. So he thought up some really good ones. And uh, so I, I just want to blame him on that. But, uh, but the big thing is, just to wrap it up, is uh, I decided that a computer game with uh, animation, characters that are animated, cannot scare anybody, no matter how good the animation is, because, um, because everybody knows they're not human. You, it, it's, uh, maybe with motion capture, you could, you could start down the path of that, of uh, getting more emotion out of an animated character, especially if you use you know, human faces and you know, human bodies. But in those days, we didn't have that, so I thought we. I had to have an. I had to have actors, that only actors could convey um, emotion. And in order to scare people, you have to ha feel. You have to have empathy toward the characters, and you can only get it with humans. But anyway, that's enough of that. So, no. So I. What I hear that you did some uh, uh, field research to try to see what <laughs> myself yeah. actually I got to the point where I was having nightmares at night I mean literally and I said okay that's enough research no yep, yep. time to get on with the yeah. game yeah you need to self care as well so yeah, we talked is. about that yesterday uh, yeah what I hear also is that uh, humans are the scariest thing on earth and yeah, that, they that are. sounds They're very about scary, right actually yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a, another question, like m not technical, but more uh, around tools. Um, how did the evolution of UI or interaction design uh, impact your work or tools? Well, I mean, obviously it does. We just went through craziness with um, VR, and that um, it's kind of a new, evolving medium. That uh, and and we went through um, uh, Roberta did with. Um, uh, the people at like Meta on the Quest 2 kind of telling us what UI we should use and yet we didn't think it was a mature medium and so Roberta spent like three months studying it and uh, said you know we're gonna throw that all out the window and do things our way and um, and uh, you know that was the Sierra way so you, you'll see when the game comes up and it says do you want the old classic way or the Roberta way although oh, no, I think they actually... call it the comfort way. Actually, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, on VR, there's, we, um, I came up with a, a locomotion that doesn't make you sick, or at least not as much. Not as sick. Not as sick. <laughs> not as sick. I mean, I don't think there's a perfect, perfect answer for that, but, um, but I really, because, I think because of our boating experience, I mean, we, we did, we circumnavigated in our own boat. We 
drove it ourselves, did it ourselves. Um, got in crossing oceans, so we got used to this, you know, and uh, and really, um, and I do yoga and I do a lot of balancing, and so I, I feel like I had a have a really good sense of of motion and how it works with your inner ear and your brain and and all of that, and I really thought about it a lot, and I came up with a way of of locomotion with um, the Quest Two that was really smooth. And uh, and and it it wasn't jerky. It was it was just really smoothly go you know going and turning and going forward and backing up and it, it wasn't perfect, but it was it was really uh, in my opinion an improvement. And yeah, and so you you mentioned Meta. Well, yeah, no, we can say that. We can say that. I don't know. Yeah. There, well, there's certain. <laughs> there's others. There's we can't others say, we're not but... supposed to say, but um, I didn't know. Okay. It's okay. No one's listening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's only only you guys. <laughs> um, and uh, and and I was. Um, I guess we we let them play our game, Colossal Cave, um, and they they said, well, we didn't know how to run your game. We didn't understand the controls. Uh, it, it's just not like it's normal. It's not normal. It's not standard. It's not what it, we all are used to. And I said, I said to her, "Well, I mine is better." Yeah. <laughs> no, I but mean, that, that I, was always kind of the Sierra way. Was to kind of say, yeah. you know, we're going to forge our path. We're going to do I it. I said this I did way, it your way, and, and it and it was it makes people dizzy and it makes them sick. And my way does not do that. Anyway, it came down to where we're gonna offer it with the standard, we call that the classic locomotion, and then the comfort lo locomotion, which is mine, uh, because it is more comfortable. And it's also easier to use, it's not so complex. But that's just me. So, uh, can, can you explain? Uh, what, what? Can oh. you explain that comfort locomotion? How did, uh, what's the difference? Well, uh, okay, I mean, see, now I know there's a lot of standard people here, and the minute that I mention what it is, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm leery about that. Uh, but it's, I mean, basically, the um, you drive, you move with your left hand, the controller, and not with your right. And, um, and you, you, there's two ways, there's a way you can steer is, well, I mean, and you have to sit in a chair that doesn't swivel and you can't be up and walking around. I mean, you have to basically sit still. I mean, that is, unfortunately, it's the way your body works, you know? And that's just the way it is. Um, but you, uh, you have your, you have, I mean, I can't really do it with this, but any, you have your, your, um, your, your forward trigger. Um, that's your accelerator. And then you, to turn, you just, like a lever. You know, it's like a lever. And I think, I was thinking in terms of a boat a uh, small lo like rowboat with a lever and you just you drive like this you don't drive with your head you don't do that um, which is I think is fairly common and uh, because your your body is not used to that that's not how we move um, we it, it, it that's why we get dizzy think about driving a car you, you know you you drive with a steering wheel you don't drive with your head you know, you're not driving and then go like that, and you're going to turn. That just doesn't work. But you can also look around while you drive. So I, I disengage the camera from the, um, from the action of, of movement. So uh, a lot of the times, the movement in VR might be in your head, turning. Uh, but that, that doesn't work for the body, for the human body. So it's like that. And then, the, you know, and there's a little more than that. Um, there's snap turns. I also was able to, um, with the joystick, um, have the, if you're standing still, you could do your snap turns really quick in a circle. But if you're going forward, you have your trigger, and you could, you know, when you use a lever, you're, it's very easy movements, very easy. But if you want it to be more tighter curves, tighter turning, you can also take your joystick over at the same time. And then you get tighter, you know, and it, and it, it just becomes very natural, just right here with one hand. And, but you can still look around, but it doesn't turn you. And uh, with the right hand controller is the, uh, is the interface for the game. Um, and uh, 
kind of took the old point and click idea from the old days um, and, uh, and sort of used uh, cursors and toggle, you could toggle with, you know, eye, hand, um, inventory objects, your inventory screen. It's all, it's all handled with the sound. That's, it. That's in, a, in oh. a nutshell. I'm very curious to see that. I'm pretty sure, I mean, if you need any help in terms of user research, we have a love, lots of excellent yeah. user researchers here. We sure we would I, love I to help. I don't know, right? I feel pretty good about it. But anyway, <laughs> but, we, but we have, but we have, uh, you know, but At we do have this. At the you ask some you. But we do have this standard, because our, our engineers, uh, you know, they, they schooled me on that. So mm -hmm. we have that and we have mine and people can do whatever they want. Yeah, we need Arena to <laughs> just bring the, the benefit of UX. Oh, no, I thought we were running out of time. So no, I, we I can. Oh, oh, don't worry. From the don't audience at some point. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Don't worry, I'll get there. <laughs> um, is there, uh, so why VR? Um, the game is playable in VR, but also um, on. Yeah, also on PC. On PC. And um, that's been a battle because of trying to get the frame rates on, well, and I, uh, anybody here that does games is familiar with trying to maintain frame rate and trying to fight it on some of the um, lower end machines, you know, like Switch, stuff like that is um, a challenge. And so, um, but we're figuring it all out. I mean, it's been a, um, you know, when I said that we like to do crawl, walk, run, I mean, you know, that's why we're not doing multiplayer on this game. It's why we're not third person. It's why, um, and it was because, although actually we thought when we started this was going to be easy, that it was going to be a port of an old text game. And um, then when we got into it, we realized, hey, this is a lot deeper game than we ever thought. And we wanted to honor the history of the game. I, some of it for Roberta and I, it was not, um, we're not trying to start a company. We don't want to get rich and famous, any of that crap. We just wanted to um, uh, fill the time during COVID and do something great that people might like to play. And, um, and we got into this game thinking it was going to be fairly simple and straightforward. And a couple of years later, we're still uh, working on it. And we're working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And we kind of initially were going to do it PC only, but then um, some of the hardware companies, for whatever reason, started calling and saying, would you please put it on Nintendo? Would you please put it on these other platforms? And suddenly, um, suddenly it's a full-time job. And, um, and we're getting up early and working late. And got, when I get home, we, we got get a to job work again. again. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's fun. I mean, it is for, you know, those that haven't done game development, it is a uh, intensely rewarding, lots of fun, and uh, kind of addictive. And um, so, I don't know if that's an answer to any question. But <laughs> well, that's, an that's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, don't get burned down, uh, out, please. We we need you to be still here and up and running. So don't. Yeah, it's it's. That's the problem with the game development, right? We get super passionate about it, and and then we yes. just like yes. lose ourselves in it. Yep. Um, so. We talked a little bit about, we, we tried to talk about tools and stuff, but um, is there anything that, that, lots of things have changed uh, through um, decades of game development, new mm -hmm. tools, new ways of working. Um, are there things that have not changed and maybe that you wish had changed? Things that have not changed and things I wish had changed. Hmm. Uh, well, things have changed, of course. I mean, it, I mean, we haven't. It's been like 25 years or so since we've actually worked on a game, if you can believe that. Um, and and to actually to be here is very is it's pretty strange for me in a sense, you know. And um, to come back into doing a game, I at first I think I it, certainly with myself I questioned whether I could do it again, you know, if I could do it. Because I always sort of thought of, of game development as a young person's thing. And when we sold no. our company, um, we were both in our early 40s. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, we're getting too old for this. <laughs> and uh, it's time to pass it on to the younger generation. And so it was a little bit um, scary kind of to see if we could do it. And uh, But it's funny, you know, it's like... Uh, what do they say? It's like riding a bike, 
And uh, if that's what you did, and if that's what, you're, what you do, and that was your passion at the time, it's still there. And I mean, we're as deep into it now as we ever were, but changed. Um, so what was it, you want to know what <laughs> has changed? Well, I, I, I'll add a comment yeah, to that, yeah. which is that um, when Sierra started, I mean, if we wanted an animation editor, we had to write it ourselves. If we wanted a music editor, we had to write it ourselves. If we wanted yeah. graphics, we had to do them ourselves. I mean, today, a, um, in fact, Roberta and I thought we'd never got, get back in the business because I mean, we had no engine, we had no nothing to start. That's true. And all of a sudden, um, an indie developer does have a shot because you're, you know, you're kind of standing on the shoulders of a lot of other people. Yeah, that's you know, at point. Sierra, we evolved a uh, engine over a 20-year period and probably if we had kept going, we'd have been, you know, like uh, Unity or Unreal or somebody like that. But, uh, and that was, Roberta thought we should um, sell our engine and continue to evolve it. But, um, yeah, no, it was cool. I mean, I, and one of the reasons we never dropped back in was because we thought we couldn't. That, um, you know, without all of that infrastructure of Sierra, but suddenly it is practical for kids in a garage to kind of uh, jump in and do something. I mean, we do have 30 people helping us now, but um, yeah. it all started with me saying, maybe I should write something in Unity. I wonder what this thing is, and then saying, wow, you can, uh, you can accomplish an awful lot awfully fast. Yeah, so. and to add to that, because uh, you're, um, he's right, the answer to your question, I think, is that, is that we, did, we, had, we had a structure with our company, Sierra, and, and now it's just him and I. And for us to come up and do a game like this, this is a huge project. And we found out, and the more we dug into this game, Colossal Cave, what a deep, complex game it is. And I'm still discovering things about it. We have the original source, the original Fortran, and we're going off of it. But we couldn't do this game without the changes. The changes being um, now uh, there's, there's Zoom, there's Teams, there's Slack. And, uh, and people are working at home now, and, uh, and, and that's becoming more set in stone as time goes on. And, uh, and so and we, didn't need, we didn't have offices, you know, we don't have anything. We're just a home like everybody else. And uh, we're, we're working with 30 people, um, and, we're still, and we're still hiring. Um, and they're all at home, <laughs> of course. All over and the world. All over the world. They're in different yeah. places. And uh, we have meetings, and we talk, and we share, and, and we couldn't do that um, in the old days. So that's a big change for us. It works. Yeah. Uh, before opening up to the audience, um, I have one question for you, uh, Roberta, more particularly. Um, so in the UX community, we care a lot about inclusion, um, make games for everyone, but also making sure that everyone can make games. Um, you touched a little bit upon ageism just a little bit um, a while ago, like <laughs> feeling that if you're past certain age, you can't make games anymore. Um, can you speak a little bit about how being a woman in an industry dominated by men influenced your career um, on the industry side and maybe in your work on the player facing side? You know, I think I've been, I've been asked that question a lot over the I'm years. I'm sure. <laughs> a lot. I wonder why. And, um, and my experience was different than the typical woman's uh, or, or young woman wanting to get into this industry in that I was among the first uh, um, computer game designers. Um, you know, on the Apple II, uh, our, my game, Mystery House, was the first game with graphics on, on, on the Apple. It was, and uh, we even got a letter from Steve Wozniak, who said uh, he had played our game and said uh, he couldn't believe what we had done, and we figured out how to do graphics. So, so I was able, I sort of leapfrogged, I guess you could say, right into the, you know, pages of history or whatever, um, just by, by um, means of, the, I was a f right there at the very, very beginning. So I think it sort of bypassed, yeah. you know, a little bit of that. Plus, uh, then Ken and I did it together as a team and then built our company. So I never had to really figure out how to, you know, if I was going to go to college and learn how to learn game design or, or animation or, you know, art or programming or whatever. I never had to to do that, so uh, it's hard for me to, um, to put myself in, that, in the shoes of, of women and young women that 
want to come into this industry. Although I, you know, I, I tried to do my part as time went on. I mean, with Sierra, we hired a lot of, a lot of women, young women, women, um, both as designers and artists. And um, I think we even had a programmer or two. Um, I, I mean, in sales, I mean, we, marketing, I mean, we had a, I mean, we were very inclusive that way back then. Um, and I, I was one of the first, the first for um, a female protagonist as your avatar in a game. And then I continued that uh, with Rosella. Was that something conscious that you wanted to do or it just happened because you're a woman? I, it was conscious. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was conscious. You know, I mean, it was because I thought, I, I had a lot of fans who were um, women, girls, uh, who would write to me all the time and, and say that they, they admired me and wanted to be like me and, you know, they wanted to do this. Is, and, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I felt that I, I wanted them to see themselves in a game. And, um, and I did, uh, I did uh, Rosella and King's Quest and, and I did the Laura Bow uh, mystery series. And then, of course, in Phantasmagoria, um, my, uh, my main character was a woman. So, um, so I did that, but, uh, but I guess you could say, I, I mean, I did my part. I, I tried. Oh, well, <laughs> repre representation tried, matters, you know, would have thought. Yeah. I tried. Yeah. yeah. Did you get more um, um, feedback from uh, women after oh, oh, uh, those oh, games? Every time. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Every time. And yeah, that they, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, it I it does matter. I it has get, I guess. I guess I get a little um, passionate with this, this question, actually, and... Yeah, no. So I, I must. I think it de it definitely touched me to do that. Yes, very much so. Well, I think it it's, it's touched a lot of people. Um, okay, can we open it up to the audience? Oh, sure thing. Sweet. So we um, the first question we've got that's the most upvoted is super serious. Um, Ken, what advice can you give to an associate level mustache grower? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Roberta would say, don't. <laughs> no, what, what I would say is trim it more often. I know, I don't even own a lawnmower, I can't. <laughs> okay. okay, cool. <laughs> the next question, uh, King's Quest Six is the reason I love games and work on games. Thank you. Can you talk about the jump from text space to point and click? How did players react to the new UX? Say that again. To it, yep. the, the so King's Quest Six is the reason I love and right. I, I love and work yeah. in games. Can you talk about the jump from text base to point and click? How did players react to the new UX? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I got mixed up with the the, the King's Quest Six in there. Um, yeah, uh, to go from text games to point and click. Um, are you talking about in the p distant past or now? Because the the game that I'm working on now was obviously a historical text game, and I am now reimagining it. Yeah, there was kind of a so, time when we made the jump from parsed games and parsed input right. games, and Infocom kind of leapfrogged us to that point in that they had a uh, really good parser that they were doing their games. It was doing um, really nice full sentence parsing, and we were still kind of bogged down in the two words yeah, stuff. Yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah, I think you're now. I get it. You're talking about going from a parser game to point and click. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Um, the first five games I did were um, were parser games, um, and they were they were also first person games because uh, that was before King's Quest, before we had uh, an animated character, a really animation. And, uh, and so what we, we started out like with Colossal Cave with one and two word commands, but then we, and synonyms with a parser, you have to have as many synonyms as you can. Um, but then we, as we went on with the first five games, we increased our, the, per, the parser to more simple sentences and then, and then on and on to what you could, you could do, uh, command two things to do in a sentence and things like that. And then, uh, but what I discovered is that um, and and I and, it, and the change came with uh, the King's Quest, my, the very first King's Quest. Besides the animation, when we went to point and click, um, 
because I, I noticed that I was, we were getting a lot more letters and fan, you know, fan, thing, fan letters, but just comments and, and everything that the parser was hard to, to deal with. They, a lot of people didn't know what to say. They didn't know how to type it in. A lot of people weren't interested or, or weren't good at the keyboard. Um, nowadays they are, but back then there were a lot of people that, that, um, that weren't comfortable typing. And, uh, and I remember thinking that uh, there's got to be a better way to make it um, more, more accessible for more people. And I was really thinking in terms of my mom, because I would have her try to play my games, and she had no idea what to type in. She just had no idea. And, and so I was thinking about my mom, and, and I developed the first point-and-click adventure game. Uh, um, the interface, and uh, I did it in order to make it more accessible for more people, but it was very controversial at the time because people were so, they loved the parser and they loved being able to type in what they wanted, and they felt they had more control over the story and over the game, and, but, um, but I'm, I'm really kind of the bad guy in that, in, in that I'm, I'm the one that said, no, 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 we got to go away from that if we want to make the games more as accessible, which worked. It did work. So it, in the final analysis, it was the right decision to make. Awesome. Thank you. Next question is, uh, do you still design your games with a big sheet of paper? Or do you feel that digital tools lack something that paper mm -hmm. has? You know, it's really, that's a really interesting question. Well, I didn't design this game. And, and I haven't designed a game since uh, my last game was King's Quest VIII, uh, Mask of Eternity, which uh, unfortunately, did not live up to the expectations, uh, but that's another story. If anybody wants to know the story of that, then you could read, Ken, read Ken's book. Um, Thank you for the plug. <laughs> not all fair. I pay um, her for that. Not all fairy now tales. Now you have to have trim your mustache for that. <laughs> not all fairy tales have happy endings. Uh, but anyway, um, but it's been over 25 years, so this game. One reason why we chose this game to, to jump back into the, um, to the business again was it was already designed, and I love the game. It was the game that started my career and Sierra because um, I, I played it, I loved it, I wanted more games like it, and there weren't any. And that's what started me to do Mystery House. So this game, we were kind of going back to our roots with this game, and, but it was already designed. So I didn't have to be on the big piece of paper <laughs> and do it because it's already there. All we needed was the original source, uh, and we just went from there. Um, but were, were I to do it again, were I, uh, if this game does really, really well, were I to sit down and say, okay, you know, I understand the business now, I understand, you know, now I know how to do VR and you know, all this stuff, is would I, if I was to come up with my own game again, yes, I would. I absolutely would, because for me, I get very creative. It, it, I always said it's like, uh, actually, I'm left-handed, um, with a pencil or pen in my hand and a big sheet of paper. I just start creating. I, I, I just create a world and with circles, and I, just, and I start peopling it. I write in. I scribble out. I add more, and it's how I think. Um, it's like my brain comes out through my arm and down through the pen, and I can't explain that. It's not computery, but what can I say? It's fair, sweet. Uh, so this one kind of plays off of the last question that was asked, but thank you. With, Re with Roberta being one of the first game designers ever, why do you think the industry ended up thinking of game design as a male occupation? Well, I, obviously, I think the obvious answer is it, it stems from uh, programming, frankly. Um, and uh, especially early on, uh, the computers, uh, I mean, let's, we don't need to go to like the Apple One or anything like that, you know, where it's that, that prehistoric. But um, it, it, they were hard to program. Uh, the, at, at the very beginning, like Ken, uh, he had to, when we figured out to do our graphics for our very first game, Mystery House, the very first gra graphics on a personal computer, uh, there we figured out, Ken figured out to use a very primitive uh, acrylic graphics tablet that could be attached to the Apple computer, uh, but it had no software. 
there, there was the, the contraption that we could use. Uh, we could attach it to the computer. It had a kind of a, a you know, a, a, one of these uh, articulate arms on it. I could do a, a kind of a simple um, picture on a piece of paper and tape it down to this acrylic tablet and have this arm, you know, kind of follow the lines with a ma magnetic, you know, um, piece to it, like a record player almost. But there was no software. So he had to write it. And uh, only a programmer could do that. I could do the art, but I needed him as a programmer. So I think it, it started out that way as primarily in those days, it was mostly men, not all, but it was mostly men that programmed, and that's probably where that came from. Yeah, I figured that around the first uh, programmers were women, so there's probably something else going on here. <laughs> Uh, so the, the last question that we've got is, thank you for everything you've done for games. Do you play a lot of games today? And if so, what are some of your favorites? <laughs> I hate to answer that um, because it, you know, I used to play computer games back in the day. But as you, when you work on computer games, and that's what you do, you kind of get burned out by it because you spend all day thinking about this game or the next game you're going to do. Um, so it got, it got to the point where if I was going to do my next game or design it, I would study my competitors. I would play their games and look at it and look at their interface or whatever it was that they were doing and make uh, come to decisions as to what I was going to do and then how I could, you know, uh, go past them. You know, how I could think of something different or, or technology-wise, you know, go beyond what they were doing. I would do that. But that wasn't really playing a game, and I, I, I lost interest, frankly, in playing games and doing my own games, and I really haven't gotten back into it. I do hate to say that. Do you um, watch movies or read books or go out in nature to get some inspiration? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I love to read and, and movies and TV shows and uh, stories. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, absolutely. I haven't lost my interest in that. No, 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 not at all. So... We're done? We don't have any more questions? We know no time? Okay. Well, thank you again thank so, you. so much for being here. Uh, can we get a big round of applause? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here.